Oh, I can I record it. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so welcome everyone. I'm just gonna go over a couple things, um, current events that are happening, some webinars, competitions, and scholarships. So the first one listed is the Cut Bill on Conference. Um, it's in two weeks, July 23rd and 24th. Um, this is put on by a new firm, Ink Landscape Architects, but also in combination with the Urban Studio. Um, Kendra came along to speak with us this past semester. Um, so we're kind of familiar with her work and her firm, but it's a new virtual conference that is kind of run by the participants. Seems like a really interesting opportunity. It is $10 for students and um, the price varies for your different um, stature as a professional, but it's $10 for students and all the money goes towards their firm, which is a nonprofit organization. So really register for that if you can. It seems like a really good opportunity. Uh, the next one is the SAH panel discussion on the removal of Confederate monuments from public spaces. So SAH, the Society of Architectural Historians. Brian passed this along to Susan last week. Um, the event has reached capacity. I think it was like 500 people, but they did say that they'll post a recording. So check back through that link, I think next week during or sometime around the 15th and that recording should be up there and that should be a really good discussion as well. Um, Susan and Terry both sent out, I think the Virginia ASLA COVID-19 Response Student Scholarship. They give out two scholarships that are $750 each. Um, they ask you two short questions in addition to your name and just basic information, but it's a really quick application. So definitely apply for that if you are in need of some extra money during these trying times. Uh, you can go to the next slide, Abby. Uh, Terry also sent this one out, the LA Plus Creature International Design Ideas Competition. This is what run through the um, LA Plus International Series, and they kind of do a different competition every year, I think, but this one is centered around this idea of choosing a non-human creature and making its environment better, whether it's through a different place, a physical um, system or a physical thing or system or process that can improve the non-human creature's life. So it's a really cool competition. So click that link to find out some more information about that. And that deadline is in October. So if you need something else to do, Alex, you can jump on this one as well. Um, next in line is the Whiteson School of Design Mind the Gap series. Every Wednesday at 6 p.m. this coming week will be Brian Jensek who works at HOK, um, so he'll be giving a talk. Don't know what the topic is, but that's always released like the week of, so tune in next week because they always have some really interesting discussions as well. And lastly, also through the Weitzman School of Design, it's a series called From the Rooftops, not a webinar, but they're just recorded lectures from the faculty in the Landscape Architecture School there. Um, they're released every Monday, and it started back in June, um, but they have a few really interesting lectures posted up there. So if you need some watching material, go click that and look at everything that they've, they've posted thus far. And I think it runs through the end of the summer. So it, that happens every week as well. All right, that's it. All right, my turn. Um, so I will be presenting about my study abroad experiences. A lot of people in the program don't know that I went to India during second year, so I will be talking about India as well as the Europe study abroad that happened last summer that we all went on. Um, for those of you who don't know, my name is Abby and I'm a rising fifth year, just to add that in for the crowd. So I'm gonna start off with India. I went to India during um, the winter semester of 2018, so that was during my second year, so kind of, very early on in my landscape architecture educational career where I didn't really know much um, about landscape. This is from the program description. So we went with Henry Dehaan, um, an opportunity to see how the influences of design, 
design decisions on the production of architecture and urban space and vice versa have defined five very different cities and rural landscapes of northern India. So I don't know if any of you know Henry Dehan, but he was the program chair in architecture for a long time, and he's still a prominent professor over in architecture at Virginia Tech. So we went to these five different cities. Hang on, all your faces are in the way. Okay. Um, we went to these five different cities. I will be sharing a lot of photography. Um, that was one of the main focuses for that trip. This was an 18 day trip that was interdisciplinary, but it had a primary focus on architecture and architecture students alone. Um, we also went with interior design students, engineers, and me as the only landscape architecture student. And there were about 12 students on the trip, plus about 10 professionals that were either practicing or retired designers. And they were all friends of Henry's. So we got some interaction with professionals as well. So we went to those five cities, which included India's Golden Triangle, which is this triangle up in Northern India, as well as Ahmedabad, which is um, kind of in the middle of India, um, much hotter than Northern India when we went. Um, let's see. We traveled from North to South to maintain a consistent temperature. So we weren't too hot during the seasonal change. And so we went to Delhi first and then worked our way down to Ahmedabad in the south. There was a major emphasis on the cultural dimensions of each city and how those dimensions changed throughout the five different places that we traveled. So these were the four topics that Henry wanted to focus the study abroad trip on. So culture, transportation, architecture, and everyday street life. All of the photographs in this presentation are ones that I took other than like two and they're labeled so you'll know. Um, but yeah, this is the, these are the four things that he wanted us to focus on throughout the trip. And he also asked us to think about the things that we wanted to focus on in our own work throughout those 18 days as well. So I chose these words and these are the things that have always caught my attention and you'll see some parallels between my India trip and the Europe study abroad that happened last summer and how these, um, these themes will kind of parallel between both trips. So this was the first photo that I took on this trip. This was the morning that we arrived in Delhi and this was out the window and I wanted to capture the fact that we couldn't see anything. Um, we woke up to a nice bright sunny day, looked at the weather for the day and it said sunny, no clouds, but we were completely covered in smog. And so our range and the scenery outside our window was pretty much fog every day. And I wanted to capture this because it's so different from how any of us would wake up in a place like Blacksburg. And um, I chose this photo primarily because it's particularly captivating following the series that came out during COVID-19 of everyday life out my window. And I thought this was really interesting that um, the everyday life of your private space and the everyday life of the public realm is only separated by this one wall. And so being able to have a glimpse of what kind of lies beyond, this is how the whole trip started. So our daily schedule, very different from the Europe study abroad, and you will see that in the second half of the presentation, but we would have breakfast each morning, not necessarily together. We would kind of just make our way down in the morning and then make sure that we got on the bus at the same time every day. We did have a tour bus. <laughs> we were that group um, through India. We had a tour guide that was with us for the entire trip, so all 18 days, same guy the entire time. Each destination that we went to, we did group tours. So we were together the entire time. And at each, just, each destination, we had a little bit of free sketching time and time to go around and photograph the space that we were at. And we would go to a lot of places per day 
So our days were very, very packed. We would be in the hotel by dark and we would have dinner and we were not allowed to leave the hotel after we had dinner. And that was primarily a safety precaution. Um, so our days kind of stopped at dinner time. And that question mark at the end is kind of, what did we decide to do at night? And I just hung out with my roommate, Sonia, because we were friends. But that was it. We, it was definitely not as open of a schedule or a trip as the Europe study abroad was. So I'm gonna start with photographs because this was the primary focus of this study abroad. And Henry wanted to put an emphasis on photography, video, and sound. And most of our conversations were centered around capturing or freezing a moment. And there was, there's a very large emphasis on that in the world of architecture. And so the parallel did make sense. Um, there was a secondary emphasis on sketching. So photography kind of came first during this study abroad. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in the second half. So this is one of my favorite photographs from India. And I do have all of the locations at the bottom of each photograph, just so that you guys can kind of follow along. So this was the Imperial Palace complex in Bajapur Sikri. And throughout most of my photographs of this space and kind of looking back on my trip to India, because this was over two years ago, this was two and a half years ago now. So it's been a while since I've been seeing the different themes that are consistent throughout can be really interesting when looking back. So I have a very large emphasis on framing and how I choose to frame the photographs that I'm taking. And a lot of that had to do with putting space between myself and the everyday life that was happening in that place to be able to not only digest what was happening, but to fully capture the scene and the mood and the feeling, particularly that was created by all of the smog or the fog, depending on which city we were in and how that changed the space. Um, so focusing on capturing the sense of place and the mood and the tone um, and the feelings created by that air pollution itself. So this is the same place, same work being done. As we walked through this area, this was a moment where we had free time um, to sketch and to photograph. And you could be about 10 feet away from a wall and not know that it was there. And so it was kind of going through this entire complex where you didn't have any idea or context of how large it actually was. And so the environment itself changed the way that we were able to perceive this place. And every single thing that we saw was primarily close up. So that can change um, the experience throughout the Imperial Palace between each person as well. This was at Humayun's tomb complex. And what I liked about this place was that the complex is separated into different nodes, into different tombs. And so there are different layers of composition that showcase a transition through space and how you're actually going to be able to travel through this old architecture. And you're able to see what is beyond the frame that you're currently in. And I thought that that added a sense of mystery and a sense of what is going on beyond this first layer that you're interacting with. And in India, in Delhi specifically, framing nature in a way that I had never seen before because nature in the sense of trees, shrubs, greenery was seen as very sacred, particularly in these complexes because there's so much built structure in these places that it can kind of overcome. And so they really wanted to showcase the meaning behind these natural features. And so being able to capture a frame like this and capturing what it actually meant to be like a, like a little snip of nature in this place meant a lot. The Taj Mahal. Um, so this is how the world sees the Taj Mahal. And I actually sent a photo, I think it was to Sam the other day, of a little calendar piece that I had that had purple and blue clouds photoshopped behind the Taj. And that's how most 
tourists are going to see and understand the Taj Mahal. And that's because of the level of smog in this area and how most days the sky is going to be the same color as this building. And so being able to kind of look behind one of, one of the wonders of the world and see what it's actually like to visit this place outside of these like iconic or like social media photographs. This was the backside of the Taj Mahal. So as you're heading through this area, beyond the tourist photographs, you're able to see a raw experience and the fact that we couldn't see a thing when we left. And so you're walking out of this very rich and awe-inspiring piece of architecture into a space of scaffolding and a long line, and it's just smog, everything's white. And you're in this long line, everything is policed. You have the little booties on so you don't scuff up any of the marble. And the photo on the right is the view behind the Taj Mahal. So you have this magnificent piece of architecture and this transition through this space of, oh, I can't wait to see what's behind what comes next. And this is what comes next. And so the contrast between those two areas just amplifies how different those two scenes can be and how that impress impressive transition or gateway can really change the way that you perceive the backside of the Taj Mahal. This was um, in the Humayun's tomb complex. This is a different tomb. My favorite thing about this place was the ambiance and how this would be completely different if you were able to see a blue sky. And it shows that the environment created by this air pollution, by this smog, changes the overall mood of this scene and changes the lens through which we see public space. And so I really like the eeriness of this place and the environment contributing to the complex nature of it overall. And I think it shows the kind of like bridging the gap between natural and built and how much the environment is playing against this built environment. And the fact that that is the sun and you can stare right at it any time of day because of how thick the smog is every morning. This is the Red Fort in Agra. And one of the most interesting things about this is that the patterns within the photograph read completely differently when in color and in black and white. And in a lot of the photos that I took in India, I did play with them on both sides of that spectrum. However, being in the red fort, the red of this brick meet, like makes this sense of place and it amplifies the pattern through which we see this place. And then this was the architecture school that Henry taught at in India for a few years. And I have a very intense, um, I love color and I love how much color can amplify a space. And this was one of the only places where there actually was a piece of artwork that was contemporary. And so having it against the stark white of this entire building changed the way that we would have seen this hallway or seen this space. Street life in India, this is an old Delhi. So this is one of the most crowded places that we went to. And I love these photos because I was able to kind of pause on a moment of color while the movement in the background is kind of blurred out and is able to continue. So you're able to see this movement through time and how busy not only the scenery is, but the environment and the place and just see this juxtaposition and this contrast. So this was a photo that I took on my phone. This is the only time that, these are the two other students that were on the trip. This was the only time that we had access to a paper map. And Eric, the kid that you can see in this photo, got it from the concierge at our hotel in New Delhi. And um, this was the only, so the entire trip, all 18 days, were very scheduled out. We had one day 
where we had free time out of the 18 days where the students could pick their own itinerary as long as they went in groups and do whatever they want. And so this was Quinn and Eric mapping out our itinerary of the next day and figuring out what the heck we were gonna do. And the fact that we only had one day to practice transportation as a group and new, new types of transportation because we took the Metro, we took tuk-tuks, and we also were on the bus in the morning and being able to walk through places of the city that we definitely should not have been walking in, but we also didn't know any better. I think this day was my favorite day because we were really able to see the whirlwind of absolute chaos that this place could be. And the next two photos um, are not photos that I've taken. This free day, this one free day that we had, we had traveled outside of the, um, central part of Delhi and we went to the Akshardham temple and the only reason why I don't have photographs of this place is because when we arrived we went there at night and we went for a night water show that they have at this temple and you are not allowed to take in your phone your camera your wallet any bags you can't have anything in your hands so no sketching materials you had to take your shoes off and throw them in this pile. We had to tie all of our shoes together to make sure that we might be able to find them afterwards. And turning over all of our belongings, you get a coin and there wasn't any guarantee that we were actually going to get all of our things back. And so after the first few moments of like, oh my goodness, this environment is so completely different and you don't have the items that you're so used to having on your person. Once we got over that feeling, we were really able to focus on creating a memory and seeing this place at night. And there are many people who call this the eighth wonder of the world, um, notably so. And we saw a water show that night and it could not have been a more unfamiliar environment, but because of that, our senses were so heightened in this place. We were able to slow down with no distractions because we had handed off all of our belongings and we didn't have to focus on seeing this place through a different lens, whether it was sketching or taking photos. So this is one of my favorite memories from India and just being able to craft our own experience from this place. So sketches, as I said before, Sketching was a secondary uh, thing on this trip. Also keep in mind that this was during second year. This was before I had taken CL's class. <laughs> so I knew nothing about sketching other than that one semester that I had with, that we had with Terry. And I had an eight and a half by 11 watercolor sketchbook, but no watercolors with me. I didn't take any. And so I just had these thick pages that I had to fill. I felt the need to fill all the time. And I did a diagram a lot. I didn't really know what I was doing. And so there's a lot of sketching what I saw. And there are some notes, there are some questions. And as I go through, the pages just get fuller and fuller and fuller. And it's kind of ridiculous when I think about it because I have a habit of turning my sketchbook and writing in any direction and so it just seems very very chaotic and I was like oh I have a little bit of white space because back during second year I hated white space and it made me nervous to have any open space on the page even though that can amplify any drawing that you're doing and so every single little crevice on these pages just needed to be build. And I think these are the last two ones that I'll show. But we were required to make some maps of each city that we went to. But obviously, not knowing much or not practicing enough with diagramming, it's a very realistic map of the place that we went to. There's not much uh, experience relayed into that map other than the small diagram in the corner that says street life and the sketches on the right um, showing 
the Maloners building, the Corbusier building that we went to on that trip. Um, all my notes say here is that it was messy and that all my sketches were messy. These are the last ones. Um, the one on the right is the map of Delhi near our hotel and how it was concentric circles going out because we were able to go outside one night and it was New Year's Eve that we were able to go out because there was this massive celebration and the entire group walked together. Our, um, the New Year's Eve, I wrote this down, where we just walked the entire middle circle of Connaught Circle before we went home. And that is a tradition over there on New Year's Eve. They have double horns. Still not really sure why that was a thing, but it was just nice to be able to show even messily that route that we had. So deliverables, this um, study abroad, we had to do a 20 page research paper and the research paper could be on any topic that you wanted as long as it was prominent in all five cities that we went to. So I, oh, loading. I don't know if it'll load, but there was a photo of trash here that I took and I wrote my research paper on garbage and pollution in India and how this affected the way that we see and interact with the public realm, either while traveling or in a place that we call home. We also had to have a Gene Egger inspired sketch piece. Um, for those of you who know who Gene Egger is with all of the sketches that kind of continuously show different perspectives. And we had to turn in what we thought were our top photographs and we had to have, I think it was 80 required pages of sketching to turn in. And so a lot of the deliverables for India were based on quantity rather than quality. And we never once saw each other's sketchbooks. And I was telling Sam that the first time I saw someone else's sketchbook was this week when I looked in on our Google Drive from when we turned everything in. So there wasn't really a sense of openness in sharing your work on this trip. And that is something that I really wish was a more prominent thing. Um, some takeaways, I have some takeaways in my notes from India. Sketch more than just what you see with the naked eye. Uh, so after this was a lot of practice with diagramming. Um, using different mediums when sketching because I used the same exact micron every single day and it was a 0.5 and it was too thick and there wasn't anything I could do about it and I didn't bring any watercolors to add any dimension to anything that I was doing and take videos because we focused on photographs and sketching and I have two videos from my entire trip in India and they were in the last city that we went to um, in Jaipur and I tried to capture the way that street life felt when you were on a rickshaw and how close all of the cars were and how you could smell the exhaust of the bus that was six inches away from where you were sitting and I wish I had done more of those to be able to capture the sound and true essence of those places. I don't know if it's gonna hang on. Let me, oh, there we go. Okay, so that's India. Moving on to Europe. So we went to Europe last summer, so the summer of 2019. And these are just some quotes from the uh, program description that Terry had sent out to us. So this might've been a little bit different for the one that you guys were advertised for this coming year. Um, so we focused a lot on scale within the city and the similarities and differences in design, building materials, regional influences, and public and private spaces, and civic and social life within these cityscapes. So we went to these 10 cities. This was a 35-day trip, so about twice as long as my trip to India. And there was about a year and a half between these two trips anyway. Um, it was interdisciplinary, but last year it was all landscape architecture students that went. 
Uh, so it was every everyone in our program. So we already knew most of the people. We were there with Terry and CL the entire time. And this is a map of the places that we went to. And we traveled from south to north um, from May into June so that we could kind of follow that heat. Um, the buzzwords that I've added are the same as before because honestly, this really hasn't changed over time, not since I went to India, not since I went to Europe. These are the things that have always kind of captured my eye and when they're, when they come together, kind of has that same nuance. And so this was the first photo that I took for the Europe study abroad. And same thing, out a window, this was when me, Sam, and Tess flew into Rome a night early and we stayed overnight before the trip began. And this was our Airbnb, um, like kind of in the outskirts of Rome, a little bit in suburbia kind of, but just being able to showcase the different dimensions of this private and this public realm and this inner courtyard that we had in this space. So the daily schedule was a lot different. We had breakfast as a group. Most often Terry would ask us what we were doing that day so that she could give us tips and tricks on where to go, what to do, and some questions to add. And then this was primarily self-guided during the day. So the entire day from breakfast to dinner, you were kind of off on your own other than a few places that we visited as a group or when we did group design exercises and assignments. Um, so kind of taking a morning to practice sketching a certain place with a certain medium or a certain, um, I can't think of the word. I don't know, moving on. Um, and so you could choose to kind of go somewhere with someone else or you could go completely on your own so that you could see a wider variety of places. And then we would have class at night, which I think was like an hour and a half, if I'm remembering correctly. Sometimes it went over, sometimes it was shorter. But we had that every single night and our sketchbooks were entirely public and we had conversations about everything that was in our sketchbooks. And then we had dinner as a group and the question mark afters because many people did different things. Sometimes Tess and Inky went off exploring. Um, me and Brooke went on a lot of walks that night and pretty much whatever you wanted, but it was more freedom after dark than in India, which was very freeing. And one night we went swimming in Copenhagen um, off of the canal. So kind of being able to tack on those extra experiences without any um, requirement of you need to sketch, you need to do this thing uh, can be very enjoyable on top of that experience that you've had all day. So I'm going to follow the same format that I did with India just for congruency. So for photographs, this is the first photograph that I took in Rome. For this trip and what was exciting about this is that it really follows the same <laughs> kind of way that my brain works with focusing on these frames and these transitions through space and showing these narrow transitions and these thick transitions and trying to see what's beyond but both of these photos were in Rome and you can see how busy this architecture can feel against the kind of starkness of the sky and that kind of heightens the aspect of both parts of this photograph. But you're able to see the everyday nuances within these photos. So having the irony of the juxtaposition on the right side as well as the two different ways of living on the left and being able to showcase how social life truly fills these spaces. And this you can tell is a clear parallel from my trip to India and showcasing these major gateways within space that are kind of covered in light and shadows and color and being able to focus on the complexities and the simple elements that make up those complexities. So being able to show those everyday elements, I loved taking photographs of the laundry that was hanging from windows because it showcased the private realm moving into that public space and that shared space. And it was kind of an offering to anyone walking by, this is our life and we're taking it outside for a little while. 
and life is very dense in a city and life is very dense in these cities and showing how much two lives can differ tremendously based on their outward expression just of a window and how different these two areas are when they're two to three feet apart. So these are three different transitions. This was deep in a neighborhood in Venice. As you can tell, there is no one in these streets. I was definitely the odd man out with people peeking out their windows as to who is the stranger kind of walking through this area. But the reason why I like these photos so much is that it shows the mystery. So kind of questioning what is around the corner, what is beyond that gateway, that framework, and where does that space lead? And the environment and sense of place as a framework and life beneath the canopy. So this is Tess um, within a park in Zurich and kind of using that environment as a frame um, of social life. Same thing here, uh, kids playing in the park when we were there and reframing elements of play on a new scale. So this is Brooke. Um, just being able to alter these elements in a way that you've never really seen them before or noticed to pause in that moment. So Sam and Brooke down here um, at, I think this was Banana Park in Copenhagen, I think. Um, but seeing that graffiti and how large, not graffiti, I don't want to call it graffiti, uh, murals. Um, those murals at such a large scale compared to Brooke and Sam on a bench showcasing the variety of scales within city life. And this was Eight House um, or Eight Talent by Big in Copenhagen. And this was, so in India, my favorite day was the day that we had to kind of do what we wanted, had that freedom to kind of make our own itinerary. and. This is one of my favorite days from our trip to Europe because we rented bikes and we saw so many different places in one day while kind of fitting into the culture of this place. So biking everywhere we went, interacting with that transit system in a new way. And so this is a house, very um, famous building, famous place but being able to see design up at a new level. So sketches, my sketchbook in Europe looked very different. There's a lot more color. There's a bigger variety, larger variety of thickness of the pens that I used. So it was really nice to have a variety of materials to be using. So these sketches showcase the Mercedes-Benz Museum and the Porsche Museum and the juxtaposition of those two elements. I have noticed looking back on all of my sketches from both trips, all of my photographs over time that it's easier for my brain to understand one thing if I'm able to see its opposite at the same time. And so one of my favorite things on this trip and it's all throughout my sketchbook is showcasing these, mu these two museums and how different they were, seeing two libraries and how different they were, and truly understanding one design more because I was able to see the other. This is Landschafts Park in Duisburg. And this was, I didn't do very many sketches in this place other than how I felt going through it. And so being able to show the like, chaos of this space um, as you travel through it, I thought was really important. This was when we went to the, it's in my head, what's that called? The Vatican um, in Rome and seeing how people, so when I was sketching this, we were sitting over here in this corner underneath the columns, underneath the promenade and seeing this giant line of people waiting to get inside the Vatican. So this is the plaza out front and the fountain as well that was in this space. But being able to fully understand and dissect one space into multiple smaller parts or smaller spaces. And so a lot of my sketches are now covered in a lot more notes. Terry told us to write more, write more, <laughs> write things that make sense and mean something. 
um, to help you understand the place that you were in. This is in Rome. This was um, one of our uh, like assignments that we had to do was to pick a plaza or a piazza um, in Rome. And we each had to travel to our piazza multiple times at different times throughout the day to showcase how that space changes. And so this was a diagramming mapping exercise to showcase how these spaces change over time, what stayed the same, and how these spaces transition. This was in Offen City in Hamburg. And this was kind of an exploration of viewports, what goes beyond, how is the contour of the land changing, how I see the space around me. And this is one of the first um, kind of diagrams that we ever did, that I ever did. Um, me and Brooke sat down in Florence one day and her and I worked together on how to diagram the different street conditions of each space because all three of them were so different. And so we both sat and we did our own solo exploration. And then I have it in my sketchbook, I didn't scan it in, but we have three diagrams that we did together. And so the collaboration and the openness of that sketchbook can add thoughts that you would not have come up with on your own, but having that conversation about that space can bring up a new dialogue. This was my mini sketchbook. It's literally like, I think it's like two inches by four inches. And it was just a little pocket one that I had. This is from Stuttgart. This was a collection of different ways of seating in these um, like swirly chairs that they had in this one plaza. And so how did they use these chairs to create different social nodes? Um, could you sit there alone or did you have to sit there with a group? How did it feel to sit right next to each other if it was a stranger or if you were far apart? Uh, and then this was a juxtaposition of the two different sides of the canal in um, Copenhagen. And then this was the Van Gogh Museum. This was my experience through the Van Gogh Museum. And throughout my sketchbook, the colors that I chose primarily meant the same thing. And so there's a lot of places where I didn't label it, but if you look through the sketchbook as a collection, it all makes sense, kind of. Um, so this one has a lot less writing on it. And then the deliverables for this study abroad, we had to do a poster and we had to do a booklet. And so my poster's on the left. Um, you can't read anything because it's way too small. But my poster focused on ephemeral experiences within space between the natural environment and the built environment. And so the framing of these um, streets and the building uh, rooftops and the sky and how having one intensified the feeling of the other and how they were both equally important in these spaces to create um, each experience. And then I did my booklet on juxtaposition, which has become a very prominent theme throughout a lot of my work and a lot of how I understand a lot of things within landscape architecture. But yeah. And then this is my last slide, but I wanted to end it with windows yet again. So it has the first photo I took in Delhi, the first photo in Rome. The one in the middle is actually my room in Pritchard when quarantine first started. The next one is in New Hampshire when I had to come home um, in April. And then the last one is in June working at our family farm. And so just being able to showcase five different examples of life beyond the private realm and where you are and seeing this glimpse of kind of what is beyond. And I really think that that's where understanding everyday life starts. And so being able to take that notion from a study abroad trip where your senses are much more heightened because you are in a very unfamiliar environment and taking those notions and turning them onto what you would consider your home environment can be a challenge in and of itself, but it can be kind of the same exercise in the um, kind of lessons that you're able to produce from it. 
So thank you for listening to me talk. And then I say thank you again. But if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Thanks for sharing all that, Abby. Um, I did have a question about how you kind of prepared for your India trip. Because I know with the Europe one, you know, everyone takes their one credit, the one credit class this semester before they go. But was there anything like that with India or any kind of seminar that you had to go to before you all went on your trip? Because that was in the winter, right? Yeah. So the fall before we went, um, it definitely wasn't as structured as the Europe study abroad where we had the weekly seminar, but we did have, I think it was two or three meetings throughout the fall and a lot of email interaction with Henry um, telling us all the things that we needed to do, the things we needed to look up. Um, but the preparation for understanding each place before we went definitely was not as much as it was for Europe because each student had to do their own presentation on a different city. We did not have that for India. It was one large presentation the spring before we went when Henry was kind of presenting his idea of this program and it was his experience in each city kind of telling how he would help us understand each place. But it wasn't a lot of preparation. I really wish there was more. Um, and looking back on it now, I know that it would be nice if there was more. But yeah, it was definitely a lot different and a lot fewer interactions. I have a, I have like a couple of parts. Oh, does that sound strange? Sorry. No. Um, I have a couple part question, but it might be, I don't know, because I know the first trip was a little bit far back, but how important do you think it is to like go to a new place? Like you're using that, the way of framing almost as a way to see a place. And do you remember if you went to India with that intention or did you find it later? And then how important do you think it is to like continue to use that theme when you visit other places? Does that make sense? Yes. I'm going to try okay. to answer it, and if I forget a part, just let me know. <laughs> okay. But the aspect of framing did was not in my mind before I went, not even in the slightest. <laughs> and I don't okay. even think it was in my mind when I was doing it when mm -hmm. I was in India. Um, I think what was actually in my brain was attempting to slow down and focus in on one thing that was happening around me because the moment I stepped foot in India, it was a whirlwind of a culture shock. And there were so many things that I didn't know and so much life bustling around me. So it was so loud and so busy and so fast and everything was just moving all the time. And I just didn't know what was going on. And I think that kind of informed the need to slow things down but not just slow things down in the aspect of point and shoot when it comes to photography. So I really was trying to kind of focus in and really zoom in on certain aspects without it just being a photo of a detail. And so I think that's why I took a step back a lot of times and being able to add that frame between myself and a certain aspect that was going on in front of me was able to tailor that experience in the proper way that I remember it happening. So I think it was my brain being able to have that tunnel vision for a moment of like, you really need to focus on what's going on in front of you. And that was how I was able to understand kind of what was happening, if that makes sense. Did that answer all the parts? Um, I guess the next thing would be, did you realize that before you went to Europe and did you continue it? And do you think it's like helpful to do something like that? I did realize that before Europe and I think the only reason why I had realized that was because in our seminar course each week um, Terry had us think of questions that we wanted to ask kind of ourselves throughout that journey 
And at one point it was like, write down 10 questions, write down three questions to kind of zoom in on the focus of each one. And one of my questions had to do with how the built environment frames the public realm within a city. And I think that could possibly be informed from India and the need to slow it down. But in Europe where, especially in Italy, where life is a lot more just relaxing, kind of go with the flow, um, it was really a focus in on certain elements rather than actually needed, needing to slow it down. Mm. And so really heightening the experience itself in the moment. Mm. Well, thank you. <laughs> I have a question. What are some things that you think the organizers of your trip could have done to make your experience, you know, traveling a little bit more inclusive or, uh, you know, a little bit, you know, just better in general? Um, thinking about inclusivity in the India trip, I, I don't talk about India very much. I don't talk about that study abroad very much. Um, I've only had a few conversations with people like Sam and Amanda and Brooke about that place. And I had like just shown them my photos like last week. And I think that the instructor or the person leading the trip definitely could have had an emphasis on an openness of our sketchbooks. I think creating a dialogue between students really not only calms things down, but helps heighten the lessons that we're learning. Um, in India, we did go with the 10 professionals and we didn't have any interactions with them. Um, I think mainly because they were friends of our instructor and it was kind of their vacation, our study abroad. There wasn't any seriousness in the aspect that those professionals could have been our mentor. Whereas on the Europe study abroad trip, Terry and CL were open to having a conversation with us any time of day about anything at all, whether it was design or life or anything around that. And so being able to have that one-on-one -on -one interaction with a professor about what you're thinking of throughout that trip and having one-on-one -on -one discussions with your peers and then group discussions, I think the power of a dialogue is really important and that dialogue was definitely missing in the first study abroad that I went on and so being able to understand that during the second one made it so much better and I think Terry and CL definitely prepared us a lot for um, the Europe study abroad uh, kind of in a traveling sense and an education side of things but in India, there wasn't really any preparation. And for those of you who went to Europe, I had a full size suitcase when I went to India, and that was the worst decision I could have ever made. <laughs> and it was awful, and I had no idea what it entailed dragging that thing around. Um, but like, we couldn't wash any of our clothes when we went to India, and so you had to pack for everything, and everything got dirty because of the smog, but no one knows that until you go. Um, but you're really relying on the experience of another person before you go. And I think Terry really shared her experiences with us in a very full manner where I didn't necessarily get that same experience during the first study abroad in India. Did that answer your question? Oh, yes, if you didn't see me, I said yes, 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 you did. Okay. <laughs> I've got a question. How do you feel like your experiences during these two study abroads have uh, kind of changed and improved your experiences with traveling? Like, I know you went to St. Louis recently, which is an example of solo travel, kind of. So, like, how has this helped you? And, like, what are some lessons that you feel like you've brought to that kind of travel? Um. So before, before I went to India, when I was younger, I did a student ambassador trip to the UK. And so when I was young, that was the first kind of experience I'd ever had with my peers in this place. And we had these leaders that we had to follow um, throughout this trip and my parents weren't there. And so being able to go to India, I was like, oh, I can totally handle this. <laughs> It'll be fine. Not knowing that we were going to land 
at the airport on the tarmac, full size plane loaded into a bus to be brought over to customs. No idea. And I think having an openness for culture shock has definitely changed. Um, I think now in the way that I invite it, and I love being able to see and understand and interact with different cultures. Um, but when I went to India for the first time, I was like, what the heck is going on? And it was very overwhelming. Um, but I think that really influenced a lot of the way that I travel now, where in Europe we had a lot fewer things to travel with and really understanding what are the necessities to understand the place around me. So having that bag that had your phone, your camera, your sketchbook, all your pens, all those things that you needed for the day and understanding that there were other things that you didn't need that would just kind of get in the way. Um, and yeah, I did go to St. Louis over spring break and I visited a lot of monuments and memorials by myself, which was really nice. And I definitely, especially after Europe, feel a lot more comfortable with solo travel in the way that there's a new confidence in being able to walk through a place that you don't know and kind of hide in the everyday life of other people. And uh, that's one of my favorite things. Like I hike by myself all the time now uh, and being able to have that one-on-one -on -one interaction with the space around you with kind of no distractions and no dialogue with another person for a moment can be really freeing. And so definitely, more solo travel in the future, for sure, um, when you know the world opens again. But I definitely think that each trip over time has influenced the next one and has given me new tips and tricks on what to do. I have a question. Um, kind of looping back to photography, it's a little bit more of a logistical question. When I, I mean, photography is so important and I don't do it often enough and it's a great way to um, catalog and, and re, uh, relive what, what, you're, what you're seeing, what you're experiencing. Um, when I'm like taking pictures with a camera, I feel like I'm taking, I'm, I'm, today I'm taking pictures because I brought my camera with me is, um, you'll have to bear with me while I find my question in here. Is I I do you did you like have a camera hanging around your neck when in, when you were in India or or like in Europe or because then I feel like it gets clunky maybe if you're taking it out of your bag each time and you know you might not want to portray yourself as having a camera draped around your neck but it might be necessary. Just uh, wasn't sure if you. Um, balancing how you're like you're making sure you're taking everything in but also like getting those specific frames I don't know if you could like so talk a little bit in India I had a like hanging shoulder bag which don't ever do that when you travel it's going to kill both your shoulders and it is the worst decision you could ever make <laughs> um but I had a single like sling bag and I kept my camera mainly in that bag. And it was a really old camera that I had had bought myself like years before and I didn't use very often. So it was a camera that didn't even have interchangeable lenses. Um, so like we're going back that far. And I either kept that one in my bag or I would like sling it around my shoulder and I would hold on to it because in India, we had to hold on to our things all the time. So you're walking through with so many crowds, someone's gonna knock something out of your hand so fast. And so in India, I came home with so many photos that didn't really have much to say because I was definitely just like, click, 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 look, I'm gonna get this one too, click, click. And then in Europe, I had a conversation with CL, which changed everything where he told me to put it in my bag. Um, and I had a backpack in Europe and I would, I had a new camera at that point and I had the interchangeable lenses. And so I would put it in the top of my backpack so that it was easy to get to. But he said that if you're doing that, it shows that the photograph is always intentional because as you're walking through, you're seeing this thing and you're like, 
you could see a lot of things throughout the day and be like, that's a beautiful moment. And then that's a beautiful moment that I really need to capture. Or that's an important thing, something that's educational that I need to capture. And being able to stand there for a moment and take a break and take your camera out and maybe change lenses if you need to can sometimes make the photograph that much more intentional. And I liked, I loved that in Europe mainly because I didn't want to be seen as the tourist with my camera around my neck all the time. If I went to India, it didn't matter what I did. This is, this is me and I clearly do not blend in. <laughs> and so I wasn't going, nothing that I was going to do was going to help me blend in in any way. I was all, me and my best friend Jake, we were always the spectacle of that environment. And so in Europe, being able to hold on to my sketchbook to take notes and sketches as I'm walking and leave my camera in my backpack not only made it more intentional, but helped me feel like I was blending in and understanding the everyday life of that space a little bit more. And I am definitely a culprit, and many people are, once the camera's in their hand, of like, I'm gonna take a photo of everything that's around me. And it can, it can just waste time and not really get what you're trying to capture. And so I leave my camera in my bag all the time now, unless I'm being intentional about capturing a very specific thing, then I'll like hold on to it. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, that was a great, great answer. I have a question. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so you have a lot of photos that are of um, taken inside a building, um, photos of a window that look outside. Um, and so the idea there is like that transition and that anticipation, I guess, that, that um, threshold between spaces. Um, and my assumption is that, um, the quality of the frame matters kind of, and how you perceive what's beyond that frame, the difference between like a, a large screen door or like a window, um, or like a large plate glass window or one with lots of small panes. I'm, I'm curious if, if there was any particular frames that you found were like, particularly special or like very appropriate to their place and like really made you want to um, move through that threshold, um, specifically like where you were living, like in your room. Um, and if maybe you had any insights on, on why they might be um, particularly kind of character giving frames. Um, I think the frames from our rooms and the places that we stayed in Europe had so much more character than the places that I stayed in India because the places that we stayed in India were like four and five star hotels in the area because that was what was chosen by the program lead. So very clean, very contemporary, very much didn't feel like it paralleled any of the character of the space that was around us. Um, but in going to, so like in India, you had that strict double pane window in between you and that public realm that was beyond. It's very stark and it's very clean. And the clean definitely does not showcase <laughs> what is actually going to be outside. And so going to Europe and starting in Italy and being able to open our windows and not have any screen on them blew my mind <laughs> um, and being able to see the shutters that kind of frame that like window space and those doors especially the one from Rome that had the two um, tall doors that opened having a frame that takes the character of that immediate space I think can enhance what you're seeing on the outside so in India it was important to see the juxtaposition of the clean and the not so clean but in Europe, it was seeing the vernacular of each space and understanding what it meant to have character within that city. And so, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. 
Oh, quick question. Did the smog in India ever cause any uh, like breathing or speaking problems? I have, um, I have asthma now. <laughs> Uh, so that was a direct result. Yeah, it's not bad, but I do have an inhaler now as a result to the lung damage from staying in those places. Um, but it wasn't terrible. It made my eyes sting a little bit, you know, because it's like exhaust and things like that that's consistently in your eyes. But you got used to it after a while. It was really nice to breathe some fresh air when I got home. Um, like being like walking off the airplane once we got to India and having my eyes sting and not really understanding because it's nighttime. Uh, I was definitely a shock, but yeah, that's a that's a little bit of problems, but you manage. <laughs> I think I was the only person who walked away with uh, any sort of respiratory respiratory uh, challenge. <laughs> Thanks for doing this, Abby. This was really nice. And I liked the organization of it all. And it was like really easy to see the differences and the similarities between the two trips, I think. Yeah. If anyone Very ever has thorough. any more questions or if your peers ever have any questions about things like this, I'm always open and willing to answer any questions or talk about either one of my trips because very, very important moments in my life. <laughs> uh, and I know that other people would agree with that for the trips that they've been on as well. But that's that. Yeah, hopefully we could maybe organize something that we're kind of like practicing sketching everyday places um, using that same intention. I think that would be helpful for everybody. Um, so next week, we're going to try to organize like a couple different things. Um, the first paragraph here is what will happen next Friday. So we could have like a in-depth or maybe more of an overview conversation about resumes, cover letters, what to include in them, how to talk about them, how to design them, um, and also portfolios. And something up and coming is People have been using more websites to display their work, so we could start to talk about those as well. Um, we're trying to quickly invite like a bunch of professionals to see who would maybe want to join in on this and talk about what they look for in these things. Um, so if you or your classmates have like we're gonna, it's like cold call, we're just gonna like cold email everybody. So if you have like anyone that you're interested in, then we can just add them to the list and we can try it out because like Sam and I have had conversations about this with the worst thing someone can say to you right now is just no. So <laughs> um, we're gonna try to like reach out to everybody that we can and see who can maybe join on and give us some insight about that stuff. And then like the second paragraph here is maybe a separate thing that's not posted by Friday, but if anyone would like to participate in making like small little five minute videos on your own portfolio, maybe the layout of it, your own resume, that kind of thing, you could do like Tess makes really good binding on like everything. So if, if she does, if you want to do a video about that, that would be really helpful. Um, I would love that. Amazing. <laughs> so little things like that. So if anybody is interested in doing those, then we could compile them into a playlist on the YouTube channel and just have that as like a separate resource. And that could be continued to be added to. Like I know Tony is in Denver with MVVA and he's doing a lot of um, AutoCAD stuff right now. So <laughs> he might be able to give us uh, like more tips and tricks on that um, later in the summer. So that's what we have for next Friday. So if you have anybody that you want us to reach out to, um, we would definitely be happy to do that. Or if you know anybody that you previously worked with or worked for that might be interested, then definitely just like ask them. Um, yeah, so it might be a panel discussion uh, or might just be a conversation. Not really sure about the format yet. Um, 
Did you guys hear that um, Ariel made her own landscape architecture firm? Yes. So I think at the end of July, we're going to try to have a, a couple alums come back and talk about where they are now. And I think she's going to lead that discussion. So she's going to talk all about it. I'm excited to hear that. Yeah. It's crazy to think because she graduated two years ago. That's crazy to think about. <laughs> she started her own. So. I think that that's all we have. Um, so thank you again, Abby, for, oh, we have sketch prompts. Wait, Abby, if you wanna talk about this, then we can end there. Yeah, I meant to type it in, but I'm not gonna lie. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> the sketch prompt of the week is yeah. just gonna be taken from the list of treasures that Terry gave us for our study abroad trip last summer. And the treasure that I chose was an interesting gateway or a thick and thin transition. So if anyone wants to sketch a gateway or a transition from their everyday environment, that would be more than welcomed. And we can add that like after the fact mm -hmm. on here in case people look back. I added it so. while you were talking, Abby, but I oh. didn't. <laughs> That's okay. We're gonna stop you can also stop recording too. It's going to take a long time for the video to process. I'm so sorry. <laughs>